All right. Um, well, I think uh, we should get started before we go too late. Um, so I'm sorry if I haven't had the chance to meet all of you yet, but I'm one of the new uh, faculty members here. My name is Fred Bake, and um, I uh, did my residency in Seattle and uh, finished my fellowship in New York um, last June and have uh, escaped this year's polar vortex and am enjoying this weather. So um, today I wanted to talk about um, some recent clinical trial data uh, that's come out for head and neck mel or for melanoma in general, um, and talk about um, you know what this means for clinical practice. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the South Bay Cancer Center. So um, if you haven't known, we recently started a clinic in the South Bay. Um, and there's a new facility there right on the junction of the 85 and 17. Um, and what we're trying to do with uh, Lisa Zaba here, who's a dermatologist, and Kim Soon, who's uh, general surgery, and as well as the rest of the oncology team, is to uh, replicate uh, the success of the uh, cutaneous oncology uh, program here at um, Palo Alto, which Susan Sweater and John Sung have really um, established. So. Uh, this is what the building looks like. It's a pretty nice and new building. It's a, there's a very nice lobby here. And I just wanted to show you this picture of the parking garage because there's actually three open parking spaces <laughs> here at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so, you know, the patients enjoy this. The, you know, I enjoy this. Um, you know, this is, it's, it's a little bit far from where I live, but um, it, it actually is a great place to... Um, to work and convenient for a patient, so um, feel free to come by and visit anytime. <laughs> so what I wanted to review today was uh, the epidemiology of head and neck melanoma. Um, next I wanted to review the recent clinical trial data on margins and sentinel lymph node biopsy for melanoma. Uh, then discuss the uh, role of immunotherapy in advanced melanoma. And finally, uh, briefly discuss some of the emerging research in melanoma imaging. So as you guys know, melanoma represents 4% uh, of all skin cancers, but uh, an overwhelming uh, majority of the skin cancer deaths. Uh, about 15 to 30% of all mel melanomas arise within the head and neck, and this represents about 10,000 cases a year. The cheek, scalp, and neck are the most common subsites in the head and neck, and uh, there is a slight male pr predominance uh, with the median age of diagnosis at 55 years. So the uh, staging uh, criteria are, as with usual um, cancers, there's T stage that's based on the Breslow thickness um, and as well as other adverse features. One of the uh, new uh, updates on the eighth edition is that the mitotic rate is no longer part of the uh, T classification. So it used to classify uh, T1A versus T1B, but it's no longer um, included in uh, the T stage. Um, the end stage is, again, um, classified according to the number of nodes, uh, as well as um, subdivided into micro versus macro uh, metastases. And um, of note, you know, any t if there is a positive node, that automatically categorizes the pa patient into a stage 3 or greater uh, classification. And um, I'll get into why that's um, important. And finally, uh, the M uh, stage is uh, classified based on the location of uh, the uh, metastatic site. So as you also know, um, melanoma uh, can be a very deadly disease. Um, you know, stage 3 and stage 4 um, tumors uh, do have a poor, very poor prognosis. prognosis. So a um, patient presents um, with a lesion on the ear. Um, one of the first things uh, to address is uh, resection of the primary lesion. And so the question comes up, what are the ideal um, margins for resecting a melanoma? Historically, five centimeter margins were advocated. And this was based on a study in 1907 um, by a, um, a pathologist who uh, performed an autopsy of a 34-year-old 30 female who had a metastatic lower extremity melanoma. And as you can see in this illustration, there were uh, numerous uh, widespread um, foci of disease. And so uh, recommendations at this time and going forward were to take 
uh, very, very generous margins. And it wasn't until 1970 that Alexander Breslow of, of Breslow depth fame observed that prognosis was actually related to the depth of melanoma or the thickness of the, um, the tumor. So he examined retrospectively 98 patients uh, with cutaneous melanoma that were surgically treated. And he observed that, the, that melanomas of thickness that were less than 0.76 millimeters did not um, have any recurrences. So this is um, a graph from that paper showing that as the thickness of the melanoma increased, uh, you had increase of uh, incidence of recurrence or metastasis. Uh, but those that were less than 0.76 had none. So this led to consideration that uh, we could possibly narrow uh, resection margins and, um, based on tumor depth. So going forward, beginning in 1988, you know, there were numerous international prospective trials looking at margins, uh, narrow margins versus wider margins, and the impact on local recurrence, disease-free survival, as well as overall survival. And what this essentially, all these studies essentially showed were that there was no difference in all these uh, outcomes when comparing narrow margins versus uh, wider margins. So here we're looking at one versus three, mar three centimeters, two versus five. The only uh, study that seemed to be close uh, was um, close to significance in terms of difference in outcomes were, um, you know, one to four centimeter margins. And so, these studies led to uh, uh, national guidelines um, that uh, advocated for um, certain uh, narrow margins based on, again, the depth of the lesion. And so, you know, in the U.S. versus the U.K., um, as well as the other countries, there are, you know, pretty good um, concordance uh, among what margins should be taken. However, Nearly all these trials did not include head neck melanoma as part of their um, uh, study inclusion criteria. Uh, only one study, the French study, included head and neck patients, but this was only 14, 14 patients out of 337. And as you know, um, you know, in the head and neck, wider margins can significantly alter the reconstructive approach to the defect. And so, you know, a lesion here with one centimeter margins could potentially be closed with um, you know, primary closure after a wedge resection. But a two centimeter margin uh, would, would really require a multi-stage approach um, as well as likely harvesting rib graft and, and um, a more complicated uh, reconstruction. And so the, the data in terms of resection margins in the head and neck specifically um, only is limited to retrospective data. Um, there was a SEER database study that compared one centimeter versus two centimeter margins in the head and neck. And what they found was uh, no survival difference among all T stages. So basically according to depth, there was no difference when you took one centimeter margins in the head and neck versus uh, the wider margins. And so obviously uh, further prospective data is needed and if um, you know, we, need, we can confidently go with the narrow margin. There is a trial um, currently undergoing called the Melmart trial, um, which is evaluating exactly this, looking at one centimeter versus two centimeter margins. That includes a head and neck um, subsite, and this um, should be closing within the next year or two. So after dealing with the primary site, you know, we, we asked the question, you know, how do we manage any uh, regional disease? And so the um, procedure of sentinel lymph node biopsy um, was um, introduced in 1977 by Donald Morton, who um, passed away about three years ago, two years ago. Um, he introduced lymphatic mapping of melanomas using colloidal gold, gold um, and lymph lymphocentigraphy. And this was essentially based on the Halsteadian principle that cancer spreads from the primary tumor site through uh, tiers of lymph nodes. And so the sentinel lymph node represents the first echelon of draining lymph nodes from the primary tumor site. Um, all the other lymph nodes beyond that represent non-sentinel lymph nodes. And so the, the role of sentinel lymph node biopsy and melanoma typically is um, limited to 
intermediate thickness melanomas, um, as well as thin melanomas that are one, less than one millimeter but have adverse features, um, such as ulceration or increased mitotic rate. Um, there is thought that larger melanomas greater than four millimeters may also benefit from sentinel lymph node biopsy as a criteria for uh, clinical trial enrollment. Um, so the purposes of sentinel lymph node biopsy are, are many. So one is to determine uh, the, draining, the draining nodal basin. So for example, in the ear, um, the draining nodal basin could either be the parotid gland or level um, 2 uh, or 2B. And so determining where uh, the, the primary tumor is actually draining uh, is important for uh, treatment and surveillance. The status of the sentinel lymph node can also help in making um, the decision for adjuvant treatment such as completion lymphadectomy or for any further um, adjuvant treatment. <coughs> Um, and as I'll discuss shortly, um, the, the status of the sentinel lymph node does provide significant prognostic information. And so the prognostic value of the sentinel lymph node um, biopsy was really studied in this uh, landmark trial, which is the multi-center multi selective lymphadenectomy trial, or MSLT. And this was a trial in 2005, which randomized 2,000 patients um, to lymphatic mapping um, or to observation. And so uh, those with a positive sentinel lymph node then underwent completion lymph node dissection. So if somebody had a positive lymph node in the parotid gland, they underwent a parotidectomy after that. What this um, study found was that there was no difference in melanoma-specific survival between the sentinel lymph node biopsy group and the observation group. However, uh, when they did a subgroup uh, analysis on those with a sentinel positive node, those who uh, underwent treatment had a, a significantly higher survival than those who ended up um, having nodal recurrences and a completion, neck, neck node, uh, sorry, a completion uh, lymph node dissection after that. And so the conclusion of this study was that the status of the sentinel lymph node is important in the prognosis of um, a certain patient. So taking that <coughs> forward, the question was, if you know the status of the sentinel lymph node and you know that it's positive, what should you do? Should you go ahead and complete the, neck, um, the lymph node dissection or should you observe? And so there were two um, multi-center prospective trials that sought to answer this question and the results of this were um, reported uh, just over a year ago. The first was M MSLT2, and the second was um, a European study that uh, sought to answer the same question. Now, the first study did include a head next up uh, cohort, and the second MSLT2 um, study also included a head neck cohort, about 14%. But this uh, study here, known as the DCOG study, did not include um, head and neck. So in MSLT2, there were 800 patients that were, uh, who had a positive sentinel lymph node, and those um, two cohorts were those who received immediate completion lymph node dissection. And the second cohort was um, stratified to nodal observation. Now, this was slightly different from MSLT1 in, in that <coughs> patients in this observation group underwent routine ultrasounds every four months in the first two years, every six months in the years three to five, and then annually after that, those that had um, concern for recurrence uh, then underwent a completion lymph node dissection. <clears throat> the results of this study showed that there was no significant survival benefit from those who received immediate um, lymph node dissection among patients who had sentinel node metastases when compared to the observation group. So this is the um, probability of a melanoma-specific survival, and they're um, showing here um, up to 10 years after randomization that there was no survival difference. There was um, a slightly higher disease-free survival, as you would expect, in the um, completion lymph node dissection, um, meaning that there were, um, these patients didn't have disease because uh, lymph node, the completion dissection basically took away um, the nodal basin, um, but again, the endpoints in terms of 
uh, disease-specific survival and metastasis-free survival were equivalent. Similarly, the DCOG trial showed the same um, results in that uh, overall survival um, at five years, or sorry, at three years was equivalent between those who underwent a completion no dissection versus those who underwent uh, observation only. So the results from these two studies led many people to conclude that uh, immediate lymph node dissection did not improve survival as compared to uh, those who were randomized to observation and delayed um, no dissection when uh, recurrence became clinically apparent. And this is, um, you know, one of the conclusions also for, from the MSCT2 study that uh, they suggested that some value may be derived from immediate completion node dissection with regard to staging as well as increased rate of regional disease control. However, this value comes at the cost of increased complications. So I think that, um, you know, one of the questions that com comes up is, you know, is head and neck melanoma different? As, as I mentioned, you know, the MSLT2 study included a, a small cohort of head and neck patients, but, you know, when, when these authors conclude that, um, you know, the, the value gain from a completion node dissection uh, may not be outweighed by the risks of complications, um, you know, I, I may have the opinion that head and neck melanoma may be slightly different compared to extremity melanoma in the, for this uh, reason. So, the MSLT2 authors uh, reported that lymphedema was 25% um, in the dissection group versus 6.3% in those who had observation with uh, lymph node dissection um, in cases of relapse. And in the most, for the most part, the severity of this was mild. Um, but I think, as we all know, it's, it's been a long time since I've seen you know, complication in terms of lymphedema from the head and neck. Um, however, as we know, patients who do undergo total um, axillary node dissection do uh, suffer from real um, and symptomatic lymphedema. But I think in the head and neck, you know, this uh, may not be as much of a barrier uh, in terms of recommending completion lymph node dissection. Uh, you know, one of the com common complications or potential complications in the head and neck is facial nerve paralysis. And so, um, several studies have shown that the injury to the facial nerve causing temporary paresis is about 10%. Um, this is compared to injury to the facial nerve during parotidectomy is slightly higher, 14 to 26%. Um, the group at uh, University of Michigan with Carol Bradford published their experience that um, essentially only one case out of 350 experience um, any sort of uh, adverse complication. So um, it's thought that in the right hands and experienced uh, people that send a lymph node biopsy um, as well as um, potentially con completion lymph node dissection for melanoma in the head and neck uh, does not uh, necessarily have uh, as much complication as uh, compared to the extremity. So the other question that comes up is, he is head and neck melanoma different in terms of recurrence and survival. So this was a, um, the table from MSLT2 and they looked, um, they stratified uh, melanoma related death by site. And when they did this, they didn't find a significant difference among sites, but there was a slight trend uh, towards decreased survival um, in uh, head and neck when patients were only observed here. Um, and a slightly increased survival when patients underwent completion dissection here. Again, this wasn't significant, but it did show an association. There have been other retrospective studies, including this year database study, uh, which looked at five-year and 10-year survival rates when comparing head neck, uh, melanoma in the head and neck versus extremity. And there were uh, significant differences in terms of five-year and 10-year survival. So, my conclusion from all this data is that, um, you know, I, I think that head and neck melanoma does represent a slightly more aggressive um, disease because of various factors, you know, the inability to obtain wide margins without, um, you know, without consideration of functional or cosmetic um, ramifications. 
And I think the lymphatic drainage of the head and neck is slightly more complicated. And so um, the false negative rates in head and neck mel melanoma uh, can be higher than extremity sites. But I don't have any prospective data to go against what MSLT2 and the DCOG trials uh, support. And so, you know, at the current time, you know, the standard of care really is against uh, routine, immediate completion lymph node dissection for sentinel node positive patients. Um, you know, again, I think everything really is on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and, but in, in the melanoma world, the shift is really towards observation with surveillance ultrasound and avoidance of completion lymph node dissection due to um, the risk of complications. Now, um, there may be another shift happening, which is um, systemic therapy of advanced melanoma. So in the past, um, for patients who had widely metastatic melanoma, uh, the only options were interferon and IL-2, which um, really didn't provide that much benefit and were very poorly tolerated. Um, there has been development of more targeted therapy uh, for BRAF mutant uh, melanoma, such as BRAF inhibitors, MEK inhibitors, uh, and more recently, um, immunotherapy. And so to take you back a little bit um, to medical school, this is um, you know, a, a diagram that shows how immunotherapy works. Um, so the dendritic cells here are um, the cells that basically prime the T cells um, to try and have them essentially attack cancer cells. Um, CTLA-4 is an inhibitory signal um, that imipilimab, which is an um, antagonist against it, essentially blocks the inhibitory signal and ramps up the entire T cell population to fight not only cancer cells, but everything around it. And so imipilimab is, tends to um, have more adverse effects uh, because it's not as selective. Um, in contrast, the PD-1 inhibitor such as pembrolizumab or nivolumab um, specifically targets uh, PDL1 on the cancer cells so that T cells that are specifically looking to attack uh, these cancer cells can attack them at a, at a higher, um, uh, with more aggressiveness. And so this type of inhi inhibition tends to be um, less associated with adverse offense, effects. So one uh, trial that recently uh, completed was a Checkmate 238 uh, trial, and this essentially um, led to FDA approval of nivolumab for stage 3 melanoma. So as you know, stage 3 melanoma is, uh, like I mentioned before, any melanoma that has a node positive. So if any sentinel node is positive, they're stage 3, and potentially um, a candidate to, to receive immunotherapy. And so this trial looked at... Um, was a randomized double-blind trial comparing the volumab to uh, ipilimumab and in patients who were stage 3 B or C or stage 4. And what this, what this trial showed was that recurrence-free survival was significantly greater with nivolumab compared to imipilimab. And in addition, discontinuation of therapy due to any adverse event was less with nivolumab compared to ipilimumab. So essentially, nivolumab was was better and it was better tolerated. And so, um, you know, this represents, um, <clears throat> you know, potentially new age of treatment for advanced melanoma. So as we talked about, we've shifted away a little bit from completion lymph node dissection to observation and even um, potentially further into um, immunotherapy for advanced uh, melanoma. So right now, that's, that's all the data that we have for you know, treating advanced melanoma, those with stage 3 or stage 4. Um, surgery really is still the mainstay for stage 1 and stage 2 melanoma. But as you can see, um, the survival curves still aren't great. So uh, one question is, how do we improve surgical margins as well as uh, sentinel lymph node um, identification? So there are, there are many technologies out there um, looking at this. I just wanted to focus on a couple. Uh, the first is reflectance confocal microscopy. 
So this is a um, newly developed um, technology that's actually been in development but uh, was recently approved um, for dermatologists to do CPT coding and so there's a lot more adoption of this. <laughs> this, this essentially brings a confocal <laughs> microscope into the clinic and it allows for high resolution live imaging of the epidermis and the underlying papillary dermis and so um, it provides op um, optical sections of about two to five micrometers it goes down to a depth of about 200 micrometers. Um, images are viewed on FOSS on, uh, rather than uh, the traditional cross-sectional images that are used to seeing in pathology um, and it, it's starting to be used for screening of equivocal lesions um, as well as surgical margin mapping. Um, some of the limitations are that it requires surface contact with the lesion um, and as I mentioned the, the images are viewed on FOSS and, and so there's um, training of these uh, new histologic features and patterns. And so this is a case example of uh, RCM in superficial spreading melanoma and so you can see this is a dermoscopy um, image of a concerning lesion and what you can see is that uh, abnormal cells uh, tend to be hyperreflective um, and disarranged. Um, there are um, these, there's a good correlation of these um, nests of abnormal melanocytes that you can see compared to H&E, uh, which you typically will see um, at the epidermal dermal junction is a honeycomb pattern and so it's something that's more regularly shaped like this. So, you know, for example, in, in this example, um, you know, there seems to be um, good identification using this technology. Um, lenticle maligna melanoma is also, you know, a, a potential um, uh, example where this could be uh, beneficial. Uh, this is most often found in the head and neck and can be a, a very subtle lesion to diagnose. Um, and because, you know, there are, tend to be a, um, irregular borders, um, achieving adequate margins can be difficult, but using uh, RCM here, you can uh, identify these irregular uh, hyperreflected dendritic processes. Um, and what this has been being used for now and studied is, is to mark out margins based on this uh, in order to help you minimize the uh, amount of normal tissue that you uh, need to resect. Now, going into how do we improve sentinel lymph node biopsy, um, a false negative sentinel lymph node biopsy is defined as uh, a tumor recurrence in a nodal basin where sentinel lymph node was taken out and de deemed to be negative. Uh, typically, uh, the false negative rates within the head and neck range between 7 and 21 percent. Um, this really has a, net, you know, a, a very bad effect on both uh, treatment uh, which causes in that it causes treatment delay um, and a false negative sentinel lymph node biopsy tends to be associated with poor survival um, namely because of the treatment delay and so fluorescence has been used in this uh, setting to help with sentinel node identification so as you know ICG or indensinine green is a near infrared dye and has been used uh, to highlight lymphatic drain in drainage in, in other areas such as um, you know, thoracic surgery where they try to fix chiral leaks, they'll use ICG in, in, in these locations. And so um, there was a prospective study looking in um, 100 pa 125 patients with a good head and neck cohort um, and they used fluorescence instead of blue dye um, and they found that the false negative rate in this um, study was about 7.4 percent or basically the lower end of the typical range of false negative um, sentinel lymph node biopsies. So looking forward, you know, how do we apply what we are already studying? So as you know, Dr. Rosenthal is um, looking at um, a targeted EGFR receptor attack with a fluorescence probe um, in oral squamous cell carcinoma, but um, is there any translatability with melanoma? And so there have been um, a couple preclinical studies in melanoma xenografts um, that have demonstrated uh, good uptake of fluorescence uh, within the primary tumor. Um, EGFR is typically not 
very um, ex highly expressed within melanoma, um, but there were there have been studies that showed that there is a upregulation of EGFR, uh, especially in patients with no sentinel node positive melanoma, so essentially more aggressive melanoma. So, um, can we um, take advantage of this and number one, improve margin control, um, but also augment identification of not only the sentinel node, but whether or not, whether or not uh, there are multiple nodes within a nodal basin um, that have disease. Um, the impact on survival um, you know, is, is to be studied, um, but I think that this has um, potential to help us with um, prognosis and identification of disease. So in summary, um, you know, I think that more prospective data is needed, uh, especially within the head and neck to determine adequate margins, as well as the role of, of sentinel lymph node dissection, uh, sorry, lymph node dissection. Um, and as I mentioned, much of that is upcoming forth in the um, Melmar trial. Immunotherapy may shift the treatment of advanced melanoma away from additional surgery. And finally, surgical mapping with new imaging technologies may increase both the effectiveness of melanoma intersection as well as um, sentinel lymph node biopsy. So I'm happy to take any questions um, and go over. Anything.